Amazing Grace Chapter 1. 1732 The twig is broken. Father Amsley, taking a morning walk in a residential street in London, stopped at the sound of a scream coming from somewhere. Upon close inspection, the screams were coming from John Newton's house right in front of him. Inside the house, Elizabeth Newton was lying in bed, covered in sweat and ruptured amniotic fluid. Elizabeth was a young wife, just past her teens. She was still beautiful even through the pain of childbirth. Her soft brown eyes were clear and warm, like windows to her soul. At her bedside was guarded by Abigail, Elizabeth's cousin and her best friend. It's a boy, Elizabeth. You are very healthy. The baby's mother sobbed silently, but her eyes shone with joy. You look so handsome. I will name her child John after her father. Young John Newton had already read by the time she was three or four, and by the time she was six she had been studying Latin and mathematics. Elizabeth not only taught her religion, culture, goodness, morality, and integrity, but also instilled in her heart the basic Christian virtues. She was much more mature than her peers. While her husband, her captain, was out at sea, Elizabeth attended church with John, where the Rev. David Jennings was pastor. Looking at Rev. Jennings, she felt that Elizabeth longed for her son to become a reverend. Even the stern and blunt Captain Newton brought presents to his wife and son when he returned from sea. Aware of her son's passion for learning, the captain often brought him books to read and sights to see. One day Elizabeth was joking and laughing with her son when she suddenly started coughing up her cough. Her cough was accompanied by a fit of suffocation and an unusual hoarse sound coming from the depths. The captain wrinkled her brow. Looking closely at her wife, she looked terribly emaciated. And with each passing day, her condition became more serious. She could sense that her time was running out now. As she lay in her darkness, all Elizabeth worried about was her son's future. Captain Newton also could not sleep. However, he decided to leave their fate to God's providence. A few months after Captain Newton's departure, Elizabeth died at Abigail's house. Her little John was tormented by her fear that her mother's death might be her punishment for breaking her promise to God that she would pray every hour to the sound of her bells. Even her father had nightmares of her dying at sea, leaving her an orphan. It was not until a year after her departure that her captain returned. She ran out to meet her father, but their reunion was awkward. She cried tears of joy, relieved that John was alive that her father was alive, and she hugged her tightly. Her father, on the other hand, didn't know what to say to comfort his child over the death of her mother, so he just said nothing. Ten-year-old John had a hard time adjusting to her new surroundings. Her stepmother, Thomason, had no experience raising her children, so she stood by and ignored John's presence. She was left alone with John without any care. Since she moved to her father's farm in Thomason, she has not only stopped going to church, nor has she studied. She spent most of her time with her wild neighborhood boys. She learned to resist authority from them, who were prone to fighting, stealing, and other delinquent practices. But when she answered her words to her stepmother, Thomason's father stepped out. He beat him with a huge belt, scarring all over his body. After Thomason had a baby, her situation worsened, and John was filled with only hatred for her stepmother and her father. On his 11th birthday, he boarded a ship with his father and began his career as a sailor. He quickly learned the basic skills needed as a seaman. For the first time, the captain felt confidence and affection for her son. Feeling that her father was proud of her, she put all her energy into becoming a real sailor to please him. One day after weeks at sea, John was on deck looking at the constellations. Can't you sleep? Someone called from behind, and when I turned around, it was Nivens, the ship's cook and doctor. Follow me. Nivens took him to the ship's kitchen, 
and sat him down on a cot. After an hour, John ran out onto the deck and shuddered with shame. He didn't know what had just happened to him, but he knew something terrible had happened. Nivens reassured him that it wasn't a bad thing and that it was a process of growing up, but John couldn't believe him. This is something only the two of us know. If you tell anyone, I will slit your throat. John wept silently from the hurt and shock of his heart. In his stillness, he heard his own vomit dripping onto the sea water. During his years of sailing as a sailor on his father's ship, John Newton matured. When John was 15, his father let him stay at the house for a year. At that time, three dramatic events happened to him while he was playing recklessly with the vitality of a young age. It was the things he did to avoid death in a situation that was no different from his dead life. John suddenly remembered the God his mother had taught him about. He wondered why God would give him a chance to live. He survived not once, but three times by a narrow margin. He prayed that he would live a godly life in the future. But that oath was lost when he returned to the seaman's life, and he plunged into a life more riotous than before. The captain, though dissatisfied with John's lack of self-control, stopped scolding, considering his son's debauchery a mere rite of passage. 